Well, thank you for that introduction. You're probably getting some background outside noises uh, as well from, from my end, indicating that we're still, still in a pandemic and still doing this virtually. So I will go ahead and switch, but this will be a throwback to the Chalk Talk days as this will be a handwritten talk using a document camera. So here we go. And I have been spotlighted, which means that I should show up big on your screen no matter what. Um, but of course, if you're having any issues hearing or seeing, please just uh, let me know. And uh, we can, now that we're experts, we can resolve any technological problem. So today I'm going to talk about two meetings of number theory and analysis. And take home message from this talk, just like the theme of the seminar being an additive combinatorics shouldn't come as a surprise, and that is that number theory and analysis make a great team. And by this, I mean they are more than just side-by-side -side black box type teammates, but they really go back and forth and uh, interplay to make progress on a wide variety of results. So we're going to get a lot out of the fact that number theory and analysis can sync up and integrate really, really well. And in particular today, I'm going to discuss two meetings, uh, as the title says, of the pair. These are, of course, by no means not the only meetings, uh, but two representative samples that are both uh, quite distinct. So the first one is going to be counting equilateral triangles in Euclidean space. And the second one is going to be statistics for random polynomials. And before I dive in into the first meeting, let me just give you a little bit of a teaser for it. And I'll do the same for the second. So specifically for the first meeting, this will involve bounding a discrete variant of a continuous operator. that will involve integration over a surface of intermediate codimension. So what I mean by this is that we're going to integrate over something and it's a discrete variant. So we'll be actually summing, you'll see what this is later on, but the surface, the underlying surface where we're, we're looking is not going to be a sphere nor a curve. So by intermediate codimension, I mean somewhere in between codimensions one and D minus one. So those two extremes being a curve and being a sphere. So we're going to look at something in between these. And as I said, this is a discrete operator and it will be fully introduced later on. But what that means is this turns into a lattice point count or something very related to a lattice point count. So we're going to be looking at solutions to Diophantine equations. And in particular, this fancy surface, this surface of intermediate codimension is going to give us some intricate Diophantine properties. So this will involve a system of Diophantine equations um, at uh, its surface or under the surface once we dive into this problem. And a key feature in all of this, and you may wonder why am I discussing this, is that those triangle counts are a byproduct. So they're simply going to fall out as a byproduct of all of this analysis. So we'll actually uncover quite a bit more from a quantitative fashion and that this count will simply fall out. Now you have to wait a minute before I dive in further because let me give the teaser for number two and then we'll jump back to number one. So number two, it's still at the top of the screen there, are statistics for random polynomials. And specifically, what do I mean? 
is we're going to ask how often does a random polynomial have Galois group not isomorphic to the full Sn, the full symmetric group on n letters. And this will again take advantage of the interplay of analysis in number theory. In particular, this will involve Fourier transforms of fancy <laughs> characteristic functions. And you may ask how fancy can a characteristic function be? It's either zero or one. Well, from a number theoretic standpoint, the things that these are looking at, I feel are somewhat fancy. So it's a bit of an oxymoron there, sort of like saying jumbo shrimp. But this will give us a lot of analysis that we're able to, to work with once we take these, these Fourier transforms. In particular, we're going to take advantage of oscillation. So that's what I mean by the analysis that we can work with is going to be embodied by this oscillation that will be present in these problems. And all together, once we set up this framework, uh, you'll see that one of the key features here is a modified Selberg-Siv. That is, if you are familiar with a Selberg-Siv, if you're not familiar with a Selberg-Siv, we're going to start at first principles. So you'll hopefully be familiar with a Selberg-Siv at the end of the talk, even if you've never seen or worked with this before. So that's the goal. So this feature here will interweave the fancy characteristic functions, their Fourier transforms, and the oscillatory properties that we're going to take advantage of, all that will give us back account for this estimate of how often random polynomials fail to have full Galois group. So again, that's the teaser. So leaving you a little bit hanging. Um, but before I return back to point one and uh, make a more specific dive, any, any questions so far? All right. And this is handwritten, but of course you can return to any slide at any point in time. Just, just let me know. All right, so here we'll start slide at two. So as a reminder, we're going to look at more details in this triangle counting problem. Okay, so before I introduce this specific triangle uh, counting problem, let me talk a little bit about a Waring's problem, which can be viewed as a less intermediate co-dimensional analog of the problem I'm about to introduce. So I believe many in our audience, at least attending right now, are well aware of Waring's problem. I will not do it justice in the talk. Um, very active area of research, um, but simply say this relates to counting Z lambda, which is going to be the um, number of integer vectors x and zd, such that the sum of k powers is lambda. So we're going to ask how many points x are on the sphere of radius lambda to the 1 over k. Now, this is a little bit funny, of course, if k is odd, these may look more like hyperbolas, but think of k equals 2 for, for purposes of this talk. Then this equation here is a sphere, and I'm simply asking for what are the lattice points on the sphere. Hardy and Littlewood, of course, were known for their estimate of z lambda all the way back in 1920 using their very famous circle method uh, initiated in this work. We're celebrating now uh, the 102nd anniversary of the circle method. And they used this method to show that Z lambda was asymptotic to lambda to the D over K minus one times the singular series term. 
This accounts for the solubility of this equation over both the p-addicts and the reals, or the prime at infinity, if you want to view it that way. And for our purposes, this is bounded above and below by a constant. But it is very interesting that the remnant of the solubility over the p-addicts and the reals, which in some ways is a continuous um, aspect of this problem, appears in the asymptotic here for the count of integer solutions. So this is the order of magnitude of our solutions. And this, from Hardy and Littlewood's perspective, was good for d large, d greater than 2 to the k. The conjecture is that you can get d all the way down to k. So number theory notation, this is greater than or equal to a constant times k. That's the conjecture. And as I said, very active area for search. Let's compare the Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic to the surface area of the sphere. So think of k equals 2 for simplicity. The surface area of the sphere is approximately the radius, which is lambda to the 1 half, to the d minus 1 power. This is equal to lambda to the d over 2 minus 1 half. This is equal to lambda to the d over 2 minus 1 times an additional lambda to the 1 half. This here is exactly z lambda. And this here is how much you lose by looking at lattice points instead of surface area. So the difference between counting lattice points and the surface area because you have a curved surface is exactly the radius here in this case. If you have a flat surface, you roughly expect the number of lattice points to be the same as the surface area. This is not so in the curved case, and this is precisely how much you, you lose. So in some sense, uh, quantitative versions of Waring's problem take into account how much you lose in terms of comparing to the continuous analog. When I write down that operator later on, in some sense, we're doing a similar type of analysis. So now before I write down the operator that we're going to analyze alluded to on the previous slide, let me introduce the underlying counting problem that we'll consider. And I do this after Waring's problem, because you'll see that this is a, a bumped up co-dimensional analog. So specifically, let's ask for the number of points on U, where U is the surface of UV, pairs U and V, um, in Z 2D. So each of these are in ZD, where U squared and V squared are equal to lambda. So if I stop here, this is the notation I've used. So this means that the sum of squares of u is lambda and the sum of squares of v is lambda. So that just is two Waring's problems separately. So I've looked at pairs where each satisfies a Waring's problem uh, asymptotic. But now I'm going to additionally require that u minus v squared is also equal to lambda. So this is an additional constraint. And later on, I will rewrite this as 2u dot v. You can just see this by some basic linear algebra. And how is this counting triangles? Well, I'm looking at, if I start at, say, the origin, vectors u at distance lambda, vectors v at distance lambda. That's what these two indicate. And then also the distance between u and v is additionally lambda. So. I'm counting equilateral triangles. This problem has a long history. And this dates back even, uh, even before the first name I'll write down, which is Rakhavan from the 1970s. So even uh, history that predates this. But I'll start by uh, talking about Rakhavan's work, which showed using the theory of Zigo modular forms that the number of u is asymptotic to lambda to the d minus 3 for all d greater than or equal to 7. In a moment, I'll tell you why you should expect lambda to the d minus 3 triangles, why this is expected count, and why this dimension limitation should be sharp. Okay. After Raghavan's work, he said, uh, Kitaoka and Nesser, and then separately Ellenberg and Venkatesh. 
used different theories. So again, um, more refined Siegel modular form theory and some piatic ergodic theory to expand this count to more general surfaces. But it was also desired to have a more circle method um, approach to this problem without developing this fancy machinery to solve this problem using a circle method approach akin to Hardy and Littlewoods um, for, for Waring's problem, or at least in, in spirit. And Deepman, Harvey, and in a separate work, Yulia Brandis were able to do this to show the same asymptotic lambda to z minus three, all the way down to d greater than or equal to 12. So again, this is the same asymptotic here using the circle method approach. So using a completely different approach. And then this is where I came along with my collaborators, Angel Kumchev and A.V. Paulson. And we were able to complete the picture to get Raghavan's asymptotic um, duplicated in the circle method fashion. So uh, we were able to extend this range all the way down to d greater than or equal to seven. And I think one of the most interesting, interesting features about our work is that, as I said, this is a byproduct of studying um, something that's much more general. So this triangle count falls out as a byproduct. So before I introduce that operator, where this count will fall out of and explain that, let me just give a few heuristics as to why you should expect this count lambda to the d minus three and d being at least seven. The first is that if we were to consider d equals six, question mark. So let's try to push this down a little bit more. Let's see why this approach that we're going to employ will fail. So we're going to compare the count on u, the surface, to the number of solutions to the parcel of Vinogradov uh, system of uh, Diophantine equations. And I won't precisely define what that is, but I will say that you get the parcel Vinogradov system from this system up here by adding in a linear equation in u and separately a linear equation in v. So more equations in the parcel Vinogradov system, more restrictive. We know the sharp count of solutions of the parcel Vinogradov system. This is due to a lot of people along the way, but the final uh, version uh, is Guo and Zhang that includes all the cases. And in their notation, the count for d equals six of this parcel Vinogradov system is asymptotic to lambda to the three plus epsilon. And this is sharp up to perhaps this lambda to the epsilon factor. If our asymptotic was able to hold all the way down to d equals six, we would get lambda cubed, no epsilon. This should be more restrictive, so less solutions, not more. So right now, this is showing more solutions than what we would get if our count um, worked all the way down to d equals six. That should not be the case. So that's an indicator that d equals seven is a natural, a natural cutoff. Also, from a number theoretic perspective, this represents square root cancellation, which is sort of the best that one could expect in this type of problem. I won't go into detail there, but this indicates that this d equals six is a, a very natural barrier. And the second heuristic will show you why you should expect um, lambda to the d minus three. And that is, if you look at the Waring's problem for u separately, you get lambda to the d over two minus one, points when you're counting just the u's separately without looking at the interactions with the v's. If you're counting the v's separately, you also get lambda to the d over 2 minus 1. And now we're going to divide by the number of interactions between them. This equation says that 2u dot v is lambda. So if you freeze one of the variables and look at the others, you see a, a approximately a, a linear equation um, in u leading to lambda. So let's divide by that lambda number of interactions in a sense. And this is going to give us exactly lambda to the d minus three. And that's what we expect. All right. So now let me write down the operator that I alluded to in the teaser and how this relates to the count that I've shown here. Okay. 
So we're going to let T lambda of two functions f and g at the point x be defined as one over the number of points on u. So remember, u counted the triangles. So we're dividing by the number of triangles. We're counting pairs u and v on u. And we're going to sample f at u and g at v. Okay, so we take two functions. Let's just say they're nice enough. So lp for some p, if you want to be precise. And we're sampling f and g at u and v, where u and v are on triangular configurations and we're dividing by those triangles. So this is a triangle averaging operator. It's sampling the functions f and g over triangular configurations. So this looks at triangular averages. One can also look at the maximal version of this, which is going to be the soup over all such lambda of these triangular averages. Now you may ask, are there any lambda that are forbidden? Um, if you go back to the asymptotic uh, and the introduction of the surface U, the only restriction is that since lambda has to be 2U dot B, that lambda has to be even. Other than that, there's no number theoretic obstructions to the types of lambda you can consider here. So if you're looking over even lambda, you can look at this maximal function, which is the maximal triangular configuration of sampling f and g. And the interesting thing to note about this operator is that t lambda, so the non-maximal version, is a Fourier multiplier. What that means is when you take its Fourier transform, it simply acts by multiplication. So what I mean is that I'm going to take this t lambda fg hat, and what I'm going to get is f hat at a Fourier variable like c, g hat at some Fourier variable eta, so frequencies c eta um, compared to the, the u and v that we're looking at earlier. And then I'm going to get this multiplication. And this multiplication and the multiplier will be t lambda hat of c eta. And I'll write down exactly what that is. So this operator, if you take the Fourier transform, you're going to get multiplication by this t lambda hat x c eta, which is precisely one over the number of u. We're going to look at uv in u of e of u dot c plus v dot eta. This means e to the 2 pi i times whatever is inside. And this is exactly our multiplier. So on the Fourier side, we're multiplying by this multiplier here. And how this relates to the triangle count is if we look at the 0, 0 frequency, we get 1 over the number of u, the sum over u, v, and u of 1, um, because this is e to the 0. So except for the averaging, this is precisely counting the number of u and v on the surface u. So this is how the triangle count is related and how it will fall out as a byproduct right here. This is the triangle count. And what we will do is we will study this t lambda hat here. So by studying t lambda hat, this triangle count will fall out as a byproduct because it's simply one of the many frequencies that we study, namely the zero, zero frequency here, which will give us that count. And the work goes even beyond that and is going to look at bounding that maximal version up, uh, up above here, the top of the page, to the largest extent possible and almost optimally. So let me just list the main theorem of the paper. So this is the paper of myself, Angel Kumchev, and A.B. Paulson. And it's just been accepted to La Mathematica, which is the flagship journal of the AWM. And it says the following. We're going to let D be at least nine. I'll say a moment, why not seven? Then T star, that maximal version, is bounded on little lp cross little lq to little lr for 
an almost optimal, so I'll put it in quotes, optimal range of PQR. Okay, so how we study the behavior of this operator is we look how it maps LP spaces. And if we start with function F and LP and function G and LQ, we're going to see what LR the operator ends up in. And we're almost able to get an optimal range. So this will give us a three-dimensional diagram of P, Q, and R. You can see the picture in the paper. And we're just off by a slight little bit for the optimal range. And namely, if one can prove a number theoretic conjecture, not the Riemann hypothesis or anything that far off, but something that's um, perhaps quite doable, in the next few years, one would actually get the optimal range. And we show how that can happen. And one of the key features from the number theoretic perspective and what sort of connects everything I'm talking about is that we're going to study these entangled exponential sums. So namely, since the variables u and v are interacting, and when we're taking Fourier transforms, we're looking at exponential sums, we're going to be looking at exponential sums over quadratic forms. And so these are some of the things we analyze and are of independent interest from the number theoretic perspective. Now, just a word as to why not d greater than or equal to seven. In these problems, it's usually very difficult to get to the low dimensions. So to push the dimension as low as possible. And for the maximal function, we're able to get all the way down to uh, nine, but not quite to that last two. However, for the triangle count, we are still able to get all the way down to um, d greater than or equal to seven. So it would be, of course, interesting to see if you could say anything about the bound in this property of this operator here uh, for d equals seven and eight. But I think one of the important things is we're still able to get that triangle count for those two dimensions as well, which will match the Raghavan's work. All right. So I'm about to switch gears to uh, topic two. Before I do that, I'll ask if there's any questions. I see there's something in the chat, so we can take a look. OK. So of course, my, sh my chat is showing a little funny. Let's see if I can read these. Um, so the first comment in the maximal operator is that an L1 norm or something else. Um, and then it looks like there's an answer. It's an L infinity norm and defining the maximal operator. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, I want to look at the range of LP norms in the maximal operator. Yes. Okay. So it looks like this is already answered in the chat. So the summary is that I'm looking at little f and LP, little, uh, little g and LQ. And for this maximal operator up here, where does it come out to be? So we're going to take this whole definition and plunk it into an LR norm. And as I said, if you want to look at the paper, there's a fun little three-dimensional picture. All right. So there's been some other work too on this from the continuous perspective and actually able to translate some of those things to the discrete perspective not in all the dimensions, um, but in some of the higher dimensions of Cook, Lyle, and Napier. So um, this was work that came out very shortly after our paper appeared. Um, and uh, you can look at some of their estimates too. So it's really interesting. We have a very sort of complete uh, perspective from the continuous and discrete side sort of all at the same time instead of as often happens a continuous work comes and then later the discrete work comes so um, as as I said there's there's a lot that's been done on this problem recently all right so Again, that slide went away, it can always come back. So feel free to, especially at the end of questions, I can pull back any, any of the slides here. Now we're switching gears and talking about polynomials. So again, number theory and analysis interaction, interacting in a different way. So the question that we're asking stems from the fact that we expect a random degree n monic fx, which will be x to the n plus 
a n minus one x to the n minus one plus dots through a zero polynomial with integer coefficients so in z join x to have gala group isomorphic to s n 100 percent of the time So as mathematicians, we know that 100% of the time does not mean all the time. So a natural question to ask is how often does it fail this? And to be precise, let's define something that will help us quantify this. So we're going to let ENF be the number of f with height h. So height h is just the absolute value of the coefficients a0 through a n minus one is at most h. So we're just counting these polynomials in a box. So we wanna cut off all the coefficients at some point so we can count them in a box and that's what we'll do. And then we're counting polynomials whose Galois group is not isomorphic to Sn. So we're going to ask, what is ENF? And if you ignore this condition of the things we want to count and ask how many polynomials are in that box, it's O of H to the N. So by adding this condition here, we're going to see uh, how that count changes. This has a long history. So history of ENF of this count. So if you look at a quantitative version of Hilbert irreducibility, you can actually show that by adding this condition here, you can already get a little o of h to the n for ENF. So as I said, there are o, big O of h to the n total. Once you add in this condition, you're already getting something a little less than, than h to the n, a little o of h to the n. And van der Waarden, in a 1936 paper, had a very interesting conjecture that ENF was one whole degree lower, big O of H to the N minus one, so that you lose precisely capital H of those when you look at Galois group that's not the full SN, and was able to show a little bit of savings. So N minus something here, star that depends on both H and N. So able to quantify that little O, but quantify it in a way that depended on both H, the size of the box and N, the, the degree. Um, the conjecture is that you would get all the way down to H to the N minus one. And since you can actually show that ENF is bigger than a constant times h to the n minus one. And you can do this by setting the constant term equal to zero. And then you can factor out an x and you get a reducible polynomial. The only thing that's left to show, want to show, that ENF is less than a constant times h to the n minus one. So this makes this problem very accessible to start at van der Waarden's bound and trying to push it down as far as you can to get to h to the n minus one. This problem generated a lot of activity over the past 85, 90 years. And a lot of techniques were introduced to try to solve this problem that had a lot of other uses outside of this. So namely uh, Gallagher in 1976 showed that ENF was h to the n minus one half plus epsilon. And to do this, he introduced the large sieve, which has a myriad of other uses specifically for this problem. David Zywina in 2010 was able to remove the epsilon, introducing the larger sieve, which again has other uses. Chow and Dietman were able to show van der Waarden's conjecture for all n greater, uh, less than or equal to four. So in the, in the small degrees. And then Dietman was able to improve Zywina's estimate in 2012 to h to the n minus square root of two plus two. 
So if you uh, look at this, actually, sorry, this is a plus square root of two, and this is, this is a minus two. Um, if you calculate out what this is, assuming I've now written this down, correct, no, down correctly, you should get just a little bit less than uh, one half. And then this is where I came along. So out of an AIM workshop that I co-organized, there was a group that started working on this problem. So myself, Isla Gaffney, Robert Lepke Oliver, David Lowry Duda, George Shakan, and uh, Rushan Zhang. And so this is just this year, this past year in 2021. Um, we were able to show h to the n minus essentially two thirds. So uh, bettering uh, deep man's bound and uh, just a little bit off from that full minus one um, that Van der Warden conjectured. This paper, the rapid, the rapid flow of things has already um, appeared online in IMRN. And then in a very exciting, Finale, Manjal Bhargava, also in 2021, a little bit after our result, um, announced earlier though in the summer, was able to show the full Van der Warden's conjecture. So yay, we now have a proof of that. And one of the interesting things is that all of these papers involve new, all involve new, different, and interesting techniques. So these papers all vary in their approaches to solving uh, Van der Warden's uh, conjecture, at least getting a part way there, and that they use very different approaches and approaches that are useful in other contexts. So as I mentioned, the large sieve introduced for this problem has a lot of other uses. Bargava's paper, very different from ours that immediately preceded it, a wide range of other techniques that, again, look to be extremely useful. So a wide range of number theory and analysis coming in. And in particular, I'll focus on one of the uh, features of our particular work, which I think will have some other uh, uses as well, and that is a modified Selberg sieve. So a modified Selberg sieve would be uh, one of our contributions and I'll label it our paper A-G-L-L-S-Z for short. And that's what I'll introduce. So again, if you haven't seen a uh, Silbert Civ before, um, do not fear this will be first principles. Let me pause and just see, it looks like there's, there's something in the chat. Um, okay, so it looks like Someone's commenting on, on the talk. Okay, awesome. Um, hey. have... <clears throat> Could I ask a yes. question, please? Sure, yeah. So I thought um, Chow and Dietman have a more recent result where they um, basically about around the same time as Bargava's, right? Yeah, think... so Chow and Dietman have another paper. So there's two Chow and Dietman. There might be more Chow and Dietmans than I'm aware of. So one paper shows Van der Roden's conjecture for all n less than or equal to four. And another one shows Van der Roden's conjecture, well, well, not quite Van der Roden's conjecture, but a variant of this problem where you're looking at um, Galois group not equal to um, Sn, oops, way up here, Sn or An, the alternating group. Right. So they consider a slightly different problem. Um, so, and they have results on that. So they're looking at counting things where Galois groups, not SN or AN. Um, and there's probably likely other things um, in, in there as well. And there may be a third Chow and Dietman paper I don't know about. Um, but uh, that one is, yeah, they're all very recent. Um, so, but uh, those should both predate, I think those both predate um, our, our result here. So I was aware of them when I was working on it. Yeah, I want to say one of them was came out like a month before of the, this or very shortly, yeah, right around the same time. Um, so again, there, there may be another Chow and Deepen paper that has, has come out and someone can enlighten me. Um, 
But yeah, obviously very, if this problem has been very active, a lot of interest, a lot of things appearing. I was just sent another preprint by someone who's working on a related thing today. Um, so I'm, uh, this is not a full history. This is just focusing on the main conjecture that Van der Woerden had and just some of the, some of the papers. There's, there's even many more than are written down here. Well, I sorry, can I add one more comment? Yeah. I think that um, Bargava, I mean, the result of Bargava, this HCN minus one, mm -hmm. is very good, but it, I don't think it's unfair to call it the end of the story because uh, I don't know. No, you, no. You could ask uh, sharper questions about like the number of irreducible polynomials which satisfy something. Like the HCN minus one just comes from having zero constant term, which is yeah, not as interesting. Absolutely. As yeah, absolutely. There's there's many more uh, questions that you can ask by adding in different conditions. So Bhargava does consider um, gala groups equal to some some specific cases in his paper. So he does look at some some specific cases, but there are definitely things that are are not covered. As I said, I was sent a preprint of a related result on function fields. The function field question today. Um, yeah, definitely not the end of the story. Like I said, um, now we have Van der Warren's conjecture, conjecture, which is, you know, in a sense, a finale to this line, but um, there's many parallel lines that um, I think are really ripe to be explored right now due to the interest and the flurry of activity here. Thanks. All right, we can definitely chit chat more about this at the end, so. Yeah, and feel free to enlighten me. Like I said, I'm um, that paper of mine is this past year, and this is the first uh, foray into this area for myself personally. So I do not know all the history for sure. Feel free to um, chip in and add to my add to my background on this area. All right. Um, so I will say that these um, texts um, that have been developed recently uh, influence some current directions. And if I have a few moments at the end, I can say a few words on this. So one is looking at Schmidt-bound. Uh, so Schmidt-bound is the best bound for a certain range of n for counting number fields of a fixed degree n and bounded discriminant. So there's some current work in progress on Schmidt-bound that should appear shortly that um, have at least some influence from uh, some of the recent uh, techniques. And then in a separate work, uh, myself, uh, Manjul Bhargava and Frank Thorne look at counting quartic and quintic fields. Um, and this is, this is a preprint, not yet public, um, but we consider, consider uh, counts for quartic and quintic fields. So different counting problems, but some of the influence of these techniques that have been uh, recently, recently developed. So as I mentioned, uh, the key feature, at least one of the key features in our approach to the Van der Warden's uh, conjecture was this modified Silberg sieve. And let me introduce a basic Selberg sieve before it becomes modified. So cover that up a moment. And let's introduce it for a very basic function, a characteristic function. So we're going to let m be a natural number, lambda d be real numbers, d be square free. So maybe I shouldn't use dollars because we're in the UK, but that's what I use here. So d square free and lambda one is one. All right. The characteristic function of m equals one this is equal to one if m is one and zero everywhere else. This, I always thought this was so awesome when I learned this in elementary number theory class. That this is exactly equal to the sum of divisors of the Mobius function that you get such perfect cancellation. Again, the Mobius function is minus one to the number of distinct prime divisors of d. And yes, this fact is in an elementary number theory book not going to claim that this is the SIF, but what you can do is you can bound this above by assuming only these mild conditions on these lambda d's, the sum over divisors of lambda d squared. And why is that? 
Well, you can write out the right-hand side as expanding the square lambda uh, d1 lambda d2. So we're going to expand out the square lambda d1 lambda d2. And then you can rewrite this as the sum over divisors E of M, where the LCM of D1, D2 is equal to E of D1 lambda D2. And here you can label this as an eta E, and you can show that eta of one is equal to one. And the sum over divisors of eta E is bigger than or equal to zero. So if you expand out the right-hand side, you show that at one, you get one, and anything else gives you something strictly bigger than zero. So you're majorizing this characteristic function, which is one or zero. So the thing that you're looking at here can now um, be subject to your choices of eta. So this problem is a bit silly because we know exactly what this characteristic function is like. But in a more general context, we would optimize the choice of eta or the choice of lambda depending on your problem. So on your problem, uh, you will have these variables, which are usually called the sieve weights, lambda, lambda sub d. And they'll be problem specific. And you get to choose them at some later point in time to be as tight as an upper bound as possible. So this type of sieve is an upper bound sieve. And we're trying to get that upper bound to be as tight as possible. Again, this is a little silly since we know this characteristic function. But it shows you the basic principle that we're working with here. Get an upper bound. Choose your lambdas to be as good as possible. And in context, what we're going to do is we can apply this same type of machinery to more complicated counts. So instead of just looking at a characteristic function, we're going to look at counting something. It's a bit more complex, such as the polynomials um, that go into E and F. And so that's exactly what we're going to do next. Let me keep this slide here so that you can see the basic setup and our first attempt and how it will parallel this, this type of a setup. So the first attempt for counting E and F, which is what we're trying to count in this problem, uh, looked like this. So we're counting F of height H where the Galois group, and we can actually reduce it to counting the Galois group being contained in A. Okay. So we're going to count things by a simple reduction to those Galois groups contained in A n uh, one. So this is exactly up to this slight modification what E n f is. That's what we want to count. And we're going to bound this above by the sum of f with height bounded by h. And then we're going to sum lambda d squared. So again, this should parallel what you have above here. Um, but we're going to subject it to the condition where f mod p is odd for all p dividing d. This condition here, I won't quite say what odd is, but it relates to the Galois group. It's actually going to be precisely when the Galois group is not contained in an. So these are the things that we're going to sieve out. So even though this is a much more complicated uh, setup, you should see that it more or less mirrors what's written above, that we have some sort of a sum of simple things, one here, or characteristic function here. And we're summing something that depends on lambda d squared, and then we'll choose those lambda d's. Well, that works, but not quite good enough to beat Deepman, um, Deepman's bound. So it does save something on the original van der Warden, but uh, not on defense bond. So we're going to introduce two modifications. Let me write them down and we'll finish, finish up the talk then. So the two modifications is weights. These are in addition to the sieve weights. I won't dwell on this too much as to focus on the second modification, which is going to replace this sum of squares that appears on the right-hand side by a quadratic form in lambda. 
So now I can introduce the final version of the sieve that appeared in our paper. And it's the following. So we're counting F with height bounded by H, gala group of F contained in AN, and we're going to also introduce a mild condition that the discriminant of F is not zero. Okay, so this is a pretty mild condition. This will allow us to weight things by factors of two to the number of distinct prime divisors of the discriminant. Um, so again, don't dwell on this too much, but this is actually really mild weighting. It will result in a logarithmic loss at the end, but it will help us out in a lot of other contexts. The key thing to focus on is instead of that lambda d squared, we're going to put in a more general quadratic form. And specifically, it will be the following, where qf lambda is going to be the sum over d1 and d2 the product over primes dividing the, LC1, the LCM of D1, D2, one plus minus one to the N plus one, the Mobius function over function fields at F over two times lambda D1, lambda D2. So this looks a lot more complicated, it is, but it's going to have several key features that will allow us to get a good count of ENF, which is basically what our left-hand side is. So why do we do this? The first thing is that this quadratic form is actually positive definite. So much like that sum of squares is an upper bound here, this is also going to be an upper bound. It has this positive definite property. The second reason is this Mobius function, which appears on the right-hand side. So you have your lambda d1, lambda d2, and then you have these factors that are appearing with them. The key thing is this Mobius function is going to tell us precisely if f is odd. And f being odd relates to not being in the uh, alternating group, and those are the things we're sieving out, and that's precisely the first addition, uh, the first addition that we wrote down here. So this really tightly relates to our problem. The third reason is this mu. It's not a characteristic function, but it's sort of the next best thing. Um, and it comes with oscillation. It has a lot of oscillation. It can be minus one, it can be positive one, it can be zero. And the nice thing here is that uh, this whole term here can either then be zero, one, or one half. The key choice here is that when this is one half, these products can be a really tight upper bound. So we're not just only looking at zeros or ones, we're looking at things that can also be one half and these one halves can multiply to be something um, quite small and therefore quite tight. The fourth reason here is that the Fourier transform as promised of mu. Again, it's not quite a characteristic function, but it relates to some of these fancier characteristic functions that appear when you're looking at this counting problem, has really nice properties. This stems from the fact that this is oscillatory and we could uh, use some work on these Fourier transforms of mu to get, again, really tight upper bounds. So this mu provided us in these weights here with a lot of flexibility. And in addition, we had flexibility in the choice of lambda d1 and lambda d2. So we got two separate choices, lambda d1 and lambda d2, that allowed us a lot of flexibility and we could choose things to really optimize them for our counting problem. And all together, all of these features here combined, we're able to show that this count ENF was uh, approximately h to the n minus two thirds. And of course, this is a full picture because once we get here, we're going to be analyzing things on the Fourier side, applying Poisson summation, doing some other work. But this is one of the key steps that was able to get us something that's really nice to analyze that has nice oscillatory properties and can provide a really sharp count to ENF, which was our original goal. And I think I will stop there and open it up to some questions.